Dorcas Wepakulu and myself are on the team of the um, African Storybook Project, uh, an initiative of SADI. And we're always keen to share what we know and what we learn from the experience of others. And today I'm going to be talking to uh, Dorcas about an experience she had facilitating a story development workshop process for the Tanzania Institute of Education um, and also for the Aga Khan Foundation. Dorcas, you were asked to facilitate the development of 12 stories for preschool children, as I understand it, contextualized to fit the needs of the school readiness program in Tanzania. What was the process that you followed um, in the workshop? Well, you see, because we had the we had the theme, so the first uh, I would say the first day we took the whole day to have the group understand the curriculum. The the Tanzanian Institute of Education have this curriculum, and it is called the the school readiness program. It's it is a it's one of the components of the early literacy development in Tanzania. So we helped the group to understand what it was, what the themes were, what the competencies were, and then. Before that then, we had now to bring them into the scenario of writing the story, but we could not start without them understanding why they were there mm -hmm. and why they were, it was so important for them to participate. So having uh, explained the themes, the competences, now I introduced the whole idea of, of them as individuals and as educationalists participating in, in materials development. And from the sharing, it was only one person who had ever done it before. Others didn't have much experience in terms of writing, but they were very interested. So we took them through the process of what is a story, so they had to understand what a story is, and particularly what is a story for a child in Tanzania who, is, who has never gone to school, who is maybe even late, and is preparing to start school. So we, we, <coughs> we got the views of the group on what is a story, what is suitable for the child in Tanzania, what is suitable for a rural child in Tanzania. And once they understood that, then we talked about how do you pick a theme. And from there, they just voluntarily picked themes that they felt they were comfortable working with. So we had them, all the themes, all the six themes covered. Some of them had more participants, with others having one person, but that was okay. And they were also comfortable working in a group, so we told them it's fine to work in a group. You can work in a group, but also produce different stories. So they, they, they worked from there, and then <coughs> having explained, then they went ahead and did what we call the first draft. They just had paper in their groups or as individuals, and they did the first draft. Then the first draft then was what we ask them to put on the wall now. On, on newsprint? Yes. yes. So okay. just as it was, raw as it was without having changed anything. So they just transferred what they had written onto the flip charts and we pinned it on the wall. And then we, <coughs> we used one story as an example. So the, or the person who had written the story read it out for the others to, to listen. Then at the end, so I just asked them what they thought about the story. They, they give their views. And then we said, okay, that was good. Then, then we, we went into how do we improve that story. And that's when we introduced how to break the story into manageable pages. And when we so did that's that, making a story into a book, really? Into a book, yeah. With different pages for yeah. each yeah. Um, idea. Yes, each, uh, and actually emphasized an idea per page. Mm. So that for these children who are beginning to read, you don't want them to crowd too many things on one page. So they so I demonstrated with one story and I, we read through and actually by the time I went to the second paragraph, they themselves now knew that an idea begins here and ends here and we put brackets brackets up to the end of the, the story and then at the end of that, so I said now you take that story as it is and now go and rewrite it with the new with the pages as we have broken it up. And I also emphasize that we didn't want stories that were beyond 18 pages. So we were between 12 and 18. Mm. And most of them were failing within those pages. So having used one, so I asked the rest of the group to go and do the same with their own stories. 
And as they did that, I just walked around and sat with each individual groups and helped them where they were staggering with where the, an idea starts and ends and I helped them. So it, it actually hastened the process. So at the end of that second day, we had drafts that we had broken into pages. So we already had like 12 draft stories. Mm -hmm. And then, so we moved from there, and then so the next stage was now to put the new clean copy on, an, on a flip chart once more. And once we were happy with that, with the language level, the vocabulary, and all that, and the length of the paragraphs, so then I asked them to start writing art briefs for, the, for, for each page. And they did that and finished, and then we also included a cover page. They also wrote an art, uh, they wrote an art brief for a cover page, Sometimes they were just saying the same the same picture on page five or the same picture okay. on. This and what page. goes into an, an art brief? <coughs> an art brief. So what they were doing was, briefs. I explained to them. I said, so you are the author. You want to have this story ready for an illustrator, and you may not be there to explain what you wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. So they gave specific descriptions of what they wanted that the picture to show. And I had also explained to them that we want to write this story in such a way that if you take out the words, the picture can still tell the story. So they understood that, and they, they, they were very detailed. They gave the color of the, the, the clothing, the gender, the character, the place the person was sitting, what they were doing. They were very, very specific. And so it, it became, it, it would be very, very easy for an illustrator to pick it and just go and illustrate because they are not wondering what color this is. So they were very specific with, with the art groups. Okay. There were quite a lot of, when we discussed this <coughs> earlier, you said that there were some very interesting issues about the variety of Kiswahili that, that yes. was used. And I wondered if you could share that. Yeah, now, we, because the, kids, the children that are targeted are children who have not even spoken Kiswahili. They don't use Kiswahili at all. Most, most of them don't use Kiswahili in their homes or in their environments. So as they, as they wrote, as we were going through the story uh, scripts, as a group, they would look at a word and say, that word will not be familiar for the children we are targeting. So they would replace it with a, a word that they either unanimously agreed was more familiar for the children in the rural areas. So for example, a word like uh, uh, parents, in Kiswahili, it's, you know, wazazi. They said, these children don't know parents. They know father and mother. <laughs> so instead of using parents, use mother and, and father. father. And don't use grandparents. They don't know that one, they don't know that one, that one word stands for the two. So, so we were, we, they went down to such things and then they said, okay, what is, what is familiar? What will they be familiar with? At the same time, they're also thinking of the teaching assistants. They're not trained teachers. They didn't want to burden them with the vocabulary. They would not be able to explain to the children. So they, they, were, they had the two in mind as they were writing the stories. But in fact, you used two different methods, didn't you? Yes. Um, the one was the <coughs> curriculum method and then you used the second method. Yes, yeah, so when, when I realized when I, when I was introducing about story development, and I said, uh, as I was referring to the ASP, I said we sometimes also use folk tales. But I felt it, I didn't want to push two ideas at the same time. So we went with the themes of the curriculum. And then when I, I moved away after the five days and I, I, I went back home, I, I left them with two activities. I said, try writing fun stories. Don't be guided by the curriculum. Just try, just any story that you think a child will enjoy mm -hmm. reading. Mm -hmm. Two, try writing using a folk tale. And so I just said, it's, the choice is yours. So when I came back, actually before I even went back, they sent me nine stories, and they were all based on folk tales. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't, none of them tried writing for fun. They said it was too difficult. Yeah. So they sent me uh, nine stories based on folk tales. And it turned out that they, they found it so exciting. They were so happy about the folk tales. They, they said they never knew they could turn a folk tale into a story. And so what we did then, we worked with the nine stories and we picked out the three best ones that, that we felt were really good. We took those three and we added on the 12 and we had 15 stories. Mm -hmm. So then out of the 15, again, we looked, you know, we used uh, uh, some criteria and we picked out 12. And so actually we dropped three from the original 12 oh. and we replaced 
with three Because you found photos. that, in fact, the folk tales <coughs> also spoke to the curriculum. They did. It's, yeah. just a, it's just about you looking at it and saying, so, like when they were reading, they'll read one folk tale and finish, and then I'll ask, so what, what theme does it fall under? And it was very quick for them. They say it was the environment, it was the family. It, and in, in most cases, you'll find that a folk tale is touching on almost all the themes. So it was up to them now to say, we, for, for writing the guide, for the, the, the teacher's guide, they will help the teaching assistants to use this particular theme to teach the, the folk tale. So we picked two, three of them, and two are on family and one on environment. Okay, tell us one of these stories. We'd, I'm sure we'd love to hear. The one that I, I liked, actually, out of those was one about the bee and the wasp. Okay. And the two of them see that the king calls the two, the wasp and the, and the bee, and says, I, I realize you're losing your children all the time. I want to give you a weapon. I, I, I want to give you a weapon. I want to put a weapon in your body. But before I do that, I want to help you to make a honeycomb so that you can protect your children. And before he finished, wasp says, I know that idea. I'm going off now. I'm going to do my honeycomb. And B says, why are you hurrying? Wait until you, you see an example of a honeycomb. But then he says, OK, hurry up and tell me, because I want to go and make one. <laughs> and then so he says, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. But well, first of all, I have to teach you how to make honey. He said, honey, I already know how to make honey. And off he goes. So Wasp ended up not knowing how to make honey. But the bee was patient enough and he waited and he was shown how to make the honeycomb and how to make the bee. And so up to now, Wasp doesn't make honeycomb. It doesn't even make any <laughs> honey. Really Only the bee knows how to make it. Thank you so much, Dorcas. Thank what you. An interesting process. Thank, Thank you. you. It was very interesting.